Good morning. Welcome to Grace Fishers. Uh, we're going to start our time this morning worshiping. Uh, we're going to sing a few songs together. Uh, but before we do, I just want to say welcome, uh, especially to our first-time guests in the room. We're glad that you're here. And if you're joining us online, uh, welcome wherever you might be. Maybe you're a snowbird down in Florida. Uh, we're enjoying 60 degrees here in the middle of February, so there's that. Uh, but we're just glad that you're here, whatever way you have come this morning. Our God has some work to do today. We're excited to engage with him and engage with one another. So I'm going to invite you to stand and let's sing.
my words fall short I've got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do Every song must end When you never do So I throw up my hands Praise you again and again For that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not I'm nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing hallelujah Hallelujah I've got one response I've got just one with my arms stretched wide Oh, I will worship you So I throw up my hands Praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know ourselves this truth oh come on my soul don't you get shy on me lift up your song cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs so get up and praise the Lord oh come on my soul don't you get shy on me lift up your song Got a lion inside of those thoughts So get up and praise the Lord Come on my soul Oh don't you get shy on me Lift up your song Cause you got a lion inside of those thoughts So get up and praise the Lord going to sing another song and it's a song that's it's pretty old it stood the test of time though it's a song that was written in 1758 by the name of come thou fount and I think there's a reason that this song has stood the test of time throughout the history of the church 
Now we're going to sing some lyrics and they're going to sound really dated, which makes a lot of sense for a song written a long time ago. But these lyrics are so rich and so full. And not only is it a way to connect with the church that has gone before us, but it's once again a way to connect to the God who is timeless, the God who continues to pour out his mercy and grace. So here's my encouragement as we sing this song. This might be new for some of us. Perhaps you've never heard this song before. And my encouragement is to focus on one phrase, perhaps one lyric, maybe even one word that God's spirit might bring to light for you this morning. I often think of verse 2, which says, Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come. Dated language, right? But an Ebenezer is actually a term from the Bible in the Old Testament, and it means stone of help. And often as God's people would would journey together, they would find these, these places where God showed up as their helper and their provider and sustainer, and so they would raise up a monument these standing stones to commemorate what he had done. So perhaps this morning as you sing that verse, you'll remember a time where God has shown up in your life, where you could have raised a monument for the way that he provided and the way he helped. Again, we just encourage you, not just in this moment, but throughout the remainder of the morning, let the Holy Spirit move and speak, be attentive to whatever might be brought to mind this morning.
Lord Jesus, we thank you for the words that you bring to mind, words of your goodness, of your mercy, of your grace, Lord, of how consistent you are, words that come through your word or through other people or even in a song. God, we just open ourselves up today. Have your will, have your way, Lord, whatever you want to do in these moments. Lord, we thank you for the truth that we get to celebrate. Lord, that we get to proclaim. God, we're just so grateful. So we just pause to say thank you. Thank you for being who you are, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to have our identity in you, that you say who we are, God. Thank you. Amen. Good, good. There we are. Good morning. Um, I love how we put the old and the new together. Um, great, great way to have our hands back in prior generations and those in the front. Well, uh, cheers for being able to wear short pants in February in the Midwest. Just saying, not just teenagers doing that. I was doing that yesterday and absolutely love it. Um, but in the next month, no matter what the weather is, you have an opportunity to bless a family in our community through donating diapers of all sizes. Um, and sizes one and two will be distributed through the Grace Care Center Food Pantry. And the larger sizes will be donated through, <clears throat> excuse me, the Department of Child Services through our partner ministry, the Hands of Hope. The kids will be joining in this. Um, you can bring the diapers to uh, the designated area there in the lobby and get a great chance to bless a family in need. Excuse me, sorry. <clears throat> but hey, why just listen to me? Uh, we have brought the associate pastor of the Grace Care Center here today with us. So would you give a warm welcome to my fellow Cubs fan, Nick Peace. That was the most important part. So, Nick, the vision of the Grace Care Center, why do you do and why does the Grace Care Center do what they do? Yeah, over time, the uh, vision of the Care Center has kind of evolved. We really want to live into um, Micah 6.8 and just allow our congregation, our community, our church to, um, to do justly and love mercy. And so that really has kind of bled into the mission uh, of the Care Center, which is to provide love and hope and sustainable change for every single friend and volunteer that comes into the care center. Love that. So then practically, how's that worked out through the care center? Yeah, um, practically, um, we're busy. There's a lot of moving parts, a lot of things going on. Uh, so we have six unique expressions the care center offers the community. Uh, the number one is our 100% uh, fully choice food pantry. Second, we have referral services where we sit down with families one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we also have uh, English class. We have vehicle services where we try to help provide free oil changes and wiper blades and just try to help keep families uh, in safe, reliable transportation. Mm. We have a thrift store, which is open to our uh, care center friends, but also the public. And then we also have a mobile pantry, which uh, we launched a couple years ago. Awesome. Yeah. So how can, how can we help? Yeah, so many, many ways. Many ways you can get involved. We would love to have you join us. Um, like I said, we're busy. Right now um, in January, in the pantry, we serve 505 families a week in just the food pantry. Mm -hmm. And on English class, the other services, on average, we're touching about 625 families a week right now. Mm -hmm. So we'd love to have you join us as a volunteer. Come jump into the food pantry. Uh, Wednesday morning especially, we could use some more hands and feet. Uh, but then also just join us by donating. Donating groceries, uh, financial donations, and then obviously mm -hmm. uh, diapers as well. Uh, I think some pictures are coming up. Um, this is what the shelf looks like at the end of a Wednesday afternoon. Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday, we are super low on diapers. And the thing about diapers is no government programs, uh, food stamps, WIC, there is nothing that help uh, mothers, young mothers especially, with diapers. And so this is a, really a way that we can step in and help love and care for families in a really real and tangible way. Awesome. Nick, thanks for coming and sharing a snippet but he'll be out there to answer questions uh, after the service. Would you thank Nick for joining us this morning? Thank you. As we come up in the middle of the month, for me, when I budget, or the way my budget works, that's when I give to Grace Fishers. I do it online. 
Um, but just no matter what way in which you give, we just want to say thank you for trusting God with the resources for another day. And so that helps reach and impact people both in the building and beyond the building, including in ways that we just spoke about. So would you join me in prayer before Kevin comes and continues our series with us? Father, it's amazing what we might take for granted that others who are in need and just don't have the resources, maybe it's a seasonal thing, maybe it's generational, whatever it is that we can just offer to help in that way. And so thank you for the opportunities we have to be able to bless others. And now this morning, as we continue to think about who we are in your eyes, Father, help us to be ready and speak to us in the way each of us needs. And we trust you with that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when my wife Susie and I were first married, we had a problem and it involved the butter. Now, I would walk into the kitchen, maybe to make a bagel or something else, and I'd go to the refrigerator, I'd open the door, and I couldn't find the butter. So then I'd start looking around the kitchen thinking, okay, somebody left the butter out, and I'd find it in the cabinet. And I was like, this is a strange place to put the butter, but I would take the butter out, I would use the butter, and then I would stick it back in the refrigerator. Now, you can probably see where this is going. Susie would come into the kitchen to make a bagel or do something else. She'd go to the cabinet, and she's like, where's the butter? So she'd search around the kitchen. She'd go to the fridge, and she's like, who stuck the butter in the fridge? Now, there was only two of us living in the house, so you'd think we would have been a little quicker at figuring out what was going on. But this actually was a thing that took us a little while we had to sit down and have a conversation about where's the right place to store the butter. Now, as most things involving our house, I defer to her, and now the butter remains in the cabinet. Yeah. It's <laughs> Apparently, there, yeah, there's, there's a little more loyalty to this topic in certain, uh, certain people than I would have thought, but it's... It's a funny story, but it illustrates uh, a problem. Anytime you have two or more people, you have uh, an opportunity for disagreement or difference of opinion. And the challenge multiplies as you add more people into the mix, as you add different backgrounds, whether it be socioeconomic, geographic, political, ethnic, religious, you can imagine the potential for difficulty, for conflict. And we all understand the challenge because we see it at school, we see it at work, we see it in our neighborhoods, sometimes in our families, and we see it pretty much in every other group where we show up. And the truth is that the church is no exception. But Jesus had a little something to say about this. And he said, when you love one another, you prove to the world that you're my disciples, that you're my followers. And we're going to look at today what Jesus said. We're not going to actually look at what he said, but how it connects to our concept of calling and how we remain unified as the church. And we know it's difficult and we understand the problem, but again, it's a part of who we are called to be. And we get some ideas on how this is even possible to live out. And so I just want to take a brief moment and pray for us. And there's a lot I could say this morning, but just want to pray that God speaks through me and that we, say, we hear the things that we need to hear this morning. Father God, you know that you have been with me over the last couple of weeks as I've sat in this passage and I've tried to understand what the passage says and then what we need to hear. And I pray simply that your voice would speak loud and clear this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're in week two of our series, A Worthy Life, and if you would grab a Bible or grab your Bible app, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter four. If you're using one of our Bibles, it's on page 979, either under your seat or in the seat in front of you. And last week, Nathaniel kicked off our series with the statement that said, our identity determines our activity. Our identity determines our activity. And what's interesting about that is that idea reflects really uh, or is a picture of the book of Ephesians. The first half talks about our identity, who we are as sons and daughters of Jesus, and then how that begins to determine how we live our lives out. And at the beginning of verse 4, we see kind of a hinge verse that Nathaniel spent a lot of time on last week. And I just want to read it briefly. 
And it says, therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Now, the writer Paul, who helped plant a lot of the early churches, who wrote many of the New Testament letters, um, he throws down uh, the prisoner card. He starts out pretty intense. He reminds them that he's in jail because he's been following his calling. But a little bit later, Paul says something very similar in the midst of all the things he's instructing the churches to do. And Nathaniel also shared this. It's Ephesians 5, 1, verse 1 and 2. And he says something similar, but a little different. He says, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you're his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. So Paul reminds us that we are sons and daughters of God. But what those, both of those verses have in common is they use the phrase, lead a life. And that phrase, lead a life, could also be translated walking. And I think as we think about our calling, the calling is the way that we walk on this journey. And I just had this image that God is calling us, and maybe we're headed this direction or that. But as God calls us, we are responding to that call, and we're moving along towards him and our calling is all about how we respond to who he's called us to be and how we live that out in our lives. And as we're going to see today, there's some individual parts that each of us are uniquely called, but the core of our calling is the same. In fact, I love Nathaniel's summary of this. He simplifies it by saying, our calling is to follow Jesus and do what he does. Now, it's not just about what we do, but about who we are and how we do it. Now, as he shared last week, Paul gets very specific. He starts to give some very specific directions. He says things like, be humble and be gentle and be patient and make allowances for each other's faults. And then Paul writes this in verse 3. He says, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit Binding yourselves together with peace. Now, I could see Paul, he's writing this letter, or maybe he's having somebody record his words, and he gets to this point, and he's saying these things. This is what it looks like to live it out. And then he says this, and I just had this picture of him pausing in that moment and thinking to himself, they're going to have a lot of trouble with this one. And maybe I need to expand a little bit more on this. And that's exactly what he does in the next 13 verses. And he unpacks a lot. It's pretty clear that Paul thinks this is incredibly important. And so verse 3 actually uh, summarizes what he wants us to know. So we're going to spend a little bit more time on this. But then we're going to look at how Paul unpacks for us what he wants us to know about this verse. And so the core of this verse is simply this. He says, keep yourselves united in the spirit. Now, you notice he said, keep yourself. He's saying, you need to preserve something that you've been given. We're not creating this unity, but it's something that we're given. In fact, he goes on to make clear that this unity is something that God's spirit gives to us. It's a gift of his spirit. And then in the next verse, Paul begins to paint a picture of how we're one. Now, you're going to see some beautifully poetic language, but what I don't want you to miss is that there's some deep theology. I don't have time to get into all of it, but we see a picture of all the fullness of who God is, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And then Paul references seven ways that we are one. And anytime you see the number seven in Scripture, it's a picture of completion or perfection. And so in verse 4, Paul begins to share how we are one. And every time you see the, one, the word one, that's a clue that's one of those things that he's talking about. So Paul says, for there's one body and one spirit, just as you have been called, to one glorious hope for the future. And when I read these first three ones, what I began to get in my mind is a picture, a picture of how he sees us. God wants us to have three-dimensional connection in our lives. And as I was thinking about that, he talks about us being connected to the body. And as you read later in this passage, and it's a theme throughout much of Scripture, that we are called to be connected to the body of Christ, one another uh, who are followers of Jesus. And so that's a sense of horizontal connection. 
but he's also called us to be connected vertically to his spirit. And then this idea of hope is this third dimension. And again, as I thought about this idea of we're being called, I just had this image that as we're called and that we're heading towards the hope, the hope that Jesus offers us, we're moving in direction, but we're not traveling alone. We're traveling with people who have been called uh, by Jesus before us. And I thought about specific people, about my parents, about people that have been spiritual mentors in my life. And then I thought about the people who are behind me of my kids, uh, the next generation. And we're called to this hope and hopefully we're traveling in the same direction together. You see, Paul has called us to have three-dimensional connection. But he doesn't end there. He continues on in verse 5 where he says, There's one Lord, and in that he's talking about Jesus, one faith and one baptism. Now, I think in the West, a lot of times we tend to make our faith incredibly individual. But it's clear that what Paul is talking about is that we share this faith with many other people. And we even tend to make our churches fairly individual. We tend to be so focused on what our church is doing. And it's one of the things that I absolutely love about pastoring in Fishers is the pat many of the pastors or most of the pastors in Fishers are for one another. And again, you see this passion that Paul has for us and how we're one. And then he ends in verse 5 by saying, One God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. He's talking about how God is our Father. Again, it's that Father and we're his children image. But Paul repeatedly through these seven things reminds us that the things that unite us as the followers of Jesus are more important than the things that divide us. And I want to say that again because I think a lot of times we spend a lot of energy figuring out how we're different from other churches or different from other believers. But the things that unite us as followers of Jesus are more important than the things that divide us. Now I want to jump back to verse 3. So Paul says, keep yourselves united in the Spirit. But you notice he started this verse or this verse 3. He says, make every effort. Now, he could have just simply said, keep yourselves united in the spirit, but he says, make every effort. And if we look at the original language, make every effort means make every effort. He's just saying he knows that this is going to be hard for us, and he knows that we give up too easily. And again, we all understand the challenges because we've seen it. We've probably lived it if you've been in church very long. But I think part of why he says make every effort is he also knows it's possible, it's not always possible to keep the peace. But he wants to push us to continue to engage and do everything that we can do. And then Paul ends verse 3 by saying, binding yourself together with peace. Now he's starting to move to how do we do this? And this phrase, binding yourself together with peace, he's beginning to tell us what our part is. And binding ourselves means to join together, to connect two things together. And I think it's also important that we understand what this word peace means. It doesn't just mean a lack of conflict, but the Greek word is equivalent to a Hebrew word, an Old Testament word. Shalom, and you'll hear us mention that word, and this is a very holistic word, which means not just a lack of conflict, but it means wholeness, soundness, health, well-being, prosperity, and the word that Nathaniel used last week, flourishing. Paul says, bind yourself together with peace. We need to connect ourselves in a way that brings health and wholeness to, to who we are and to that end, Paul introduces a new idea in verse 7 when he says this. He says, however, each, he has given each one of us a special gift through the, gener through the generosity of Christ. And so Paul is introducing a couple of ideas here. First, he's introducing the idea of spiritual gifts. And these are gifts that are given to us through the Holy Spirit. They're not just natural talents. And I don't have time to read verses 8 through 10. There's a lot in there. It is a little bit complicated. But 
that idea of spiritual gifts is one, um, uh, and the language describes Christ coming down out of heaven. It's a, it's a picture of his life, death, and resurrection. It's also a picture of him being a conquering king, freeing captives. And then as a king would, uh, would celebrate his victory, sometimes he would give gifts. And that's a picture of what Jesus did is that he began to give us these gifts. And it's also a reminder that we were created all to be different. We're all unique and we're all different. And that's both part of the solution that Paul uh, is going to begin to talk about. It's also part of the challenge. It's because we're different and we see the world differently and we have different experiences. It can create opportunities for conflict. Now, anytime the scriptures talk about this idea of spiritual gifts, I think what our tendency is, is we want to begin to hyper-focus on what's my gift, what's my thing. And most of the time that the scriptures talk about spiritual gifts, they're focused on reminding us that we all have a gift, that we're all called to use the gift. And actually, Paul usually spends more time talking about how we use the gifts in relating to one another. And so if you're curious about reading more about spiritual gifts, there's a, a link in our Grace Fisher Zap Notes that begins to describe some other passages. I'd encourage you to go read that later. But I want to give you an image that as I was reflecting on it this week, I thought was a great picture of, of spiritual gifts. You know, when, when you're little and you go to a friend's birthday party, typically, you know, you may not even know necessarily what your friend, your friend likes. Um, you, don't, you can't drive, you can't go get stuff. And so your mom would either go to the store or she'd get on Amazon and order a gift for your friend. And then as you head to the party, your mom gives you this gift. And the gift isn't for you. It's a gift that's been given to you, but you're to show up to the party and you're to give the gift to your friend. The gift, again, isn't for you. You don't keep it in your pocket. That, that's missing the point of the gift. You're supposed to show up to the party and celebrate your friend and bless your friend by giving him the gift. And if you jump down to verse 16, Paul begins to describe what begins to happen to us if we begin to use our gift. He says this in verse 16. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. You see, when you do your part, when you use your gift, it helps me. And when I do my part or use my gift, it helps you. You see, we're called to become more and more like Jesus, but I can't become more like Jesus if you're not exercising your gifts, if you're not doing the things that you're called to do that help make me better. And again, I'm not going to read the verses, but what Paul begins to tell us is that we begin to grow, we begin to be healthier. In fact, he uses an illustration. He says, we're no longer like immature children. There are things that our kids do or ways that we care for them. You know, when our kids are two, if they had a tantrum, it might be cute, but we might correct them. When our kids are 18, those behaviors aren't cute any longer. And God calls us to exercise our gifts so that we can grow and mature and become fully in this world a reflection of who he's called us to be, both as individuals and as his church. Now, again, I'm not reading through this whole section, but what I would encourage you to do this week as you reflect on this further is just to take some time and read uh, Paul's words because they are beautifully poetic but I think there's some practical application. I think there's some real gold. And if we begin to think about what is Paul actually calling us to do, I think he's simply calling us to be peacekeepers. And as I was thinking about how do we make this really practical, um, I began to think of an illustration from the first uh, part of my ministry life for the first 13 years that I was on staff at a church. Um, I was a small groups associate pastor, and we, our job was really to help launch small groups and to help them think about how do we be healthy as a group. And this was a model that we taught group leaders, and it was stage of healthy group development. 
And the first stage is simply forming as a group comes together. You know, there's kind of this honeymoon stage where as you're meeting new people and you're in a group together, you're like, man, this is cool and it's exciting and I'm making some new connections. But at some point, the honeymoon begins to end. And so after the group is forming and eventually, whether it's weeks or months, it enters a storming stage. And you begin to notice that person that's on your group or on your team. You're like, you know, they're a little odd. Or that thing that they said, I don't know how they got there. But the reality is when we're around people that are different than us, there's a potential for conflict. And what we would teach small, group, small groups is that, or teams is as you move into that conflict and you learn how to respond in ways that are healthy, you begin to come through that season into a season of norming. We begin to figure out how we relate um, to one another. And then as we begin to do that over time, we, move, we shift into a season that we would call performing. We begin to figure out how we respond. Now, Jacob, make sure you leave that illustration up there because I want to talk about some things that tend to happen to us. Um, and again, this was for small groups, but I think it applies to us as we engage really in any part of our life. So you don't have to be a follower of Jesus for this to be practical, but I think it's really important for us who are followers of Jesus as we step into engaging any part of the church. And the first thing that I think happens is we count ourselves out. We're not even part of the forming process. And some of this Maybe because of an experience that we've had or there's some, something that keeps us from stepping in. We might be looking around and comparing ourselves to other people. But we tend to stay on the sidelines and think, ah, I've got gifted people all around me. I don't think they need what I have to bring. Or if we do take a step in, another thing that tends to happen is we begin to see some conflict emerge and we go, okay, I'm going to take the off-ramp now, and so I'm not going to move into the storming stage. Uh, I'm not going to deal with the conflict. I'm not going to go talk to the person. And so we take the off-ramp and we say, I'm out. And maybe we quit the group or team or we pull ourselves out of it. Or the last thing we do, we see the conflict brewing, and maybe we stay a part of the group or a team, but we kind of jump over that step of storming, and we just kind of pretend that the thing isn't there, and it's maybe there, but we just kind of all ignore it, and we're stepping around it. It's like the proverbial elephant in the room, and we might actually move to norming, but it's an unhealthy norming as we don't learn to deal with the thing that is right in front of us. And what Paul is calling us to do is move through the stages of as we begin to engage with people who think differently, who act differently than we are, he calls us to continue to connect and be one as his body. And so to think about, there's lots of things I could say, don't do this. But what I want us to think about briefly this morning is three things that we are called to do. And these are things that are progressive that kind of mirror this idea of stages of healthy development uh, as a part of a group. And the first thing that Paul is clearly calling us to do, he's implying, is that we're to be connected with one another. We're to be in relationship with one another. We're to be using our gifts to, with one another. And it's fascinating if you do any study or research, um, there's a book that just came out that talks about the fact that we are in the largest religious shift in the history of the United States. And the shift is this, and it's, there's lots of reasons, I don't have time to go uh, into it, but more people have left the church in the last 20 years uh, than in the history of the United States. More and more, and many of these people are, would still consider themselves followers of Jesus, but they're doing life alone. But I think when you do that, you're missing out on what Paul is calling us to do. And again, I, I understand if you uh, if you had a bad experience with church or just had a bad experience with people in general, that the idea of being connected with other people can be scary, it can be difficult, but here's my challenge to you. Maybe now is the time to take another step and start small. You can go slow, but we are called to be connected. 
And then the next two things are really, I think, a, a picture of how we're supposed to be connected with one another. And the next thing we're called to do is to be curious. So we're supposed to be connected, but I think as we do that, we're supposed to, we should be curious. Um, as we encounter people who think differently or act differently or they may hold a different political perspective than we do, we need to be curious and we need to ask questions. Why do you think that way? Why do you feel that way? Why do you believe that way? And I think we need to be curious and wrestle with why they're different or why they think differently. We need to ask a lot of questions. And the way they got there may be very different than the way we think. And I think we just have to continue to wrestle with being learners and being curious. And we need to be careful not to divide fellowship just because somebody thinks or acts or even voted differently than we did. We need to be curious. And then lastly, and I think this is a little bit of a balance here, is we need to be candid because keeping unity doesn't mean to pretend or fake agreement just to avoid conflict. And one of the things when we launched Grace Fishers, uh, our leadership team was at that point was made up of three of us, Joey Christensen, Wendy Herberg, and myself. And one of the commitments that I remember vividly we made to one another is that we looked at each other in the eye and we said, if we're going to do this thing, that we have to continue to be candid. And if there's difficulties between the three of us or we don't understand something, we have to be candid. We have to go to one another and we have to talk about it. And we've had to live that because we can't have a unified church if we've got a disunified leadership. And we can't have a unified church if we have a disunified staff. And we have to model what we're asking other people to do. But we are called to be candid, to be authentic, to work through challenges and difficult situation. And I think the reality is when you think about this idea of being curious or being candid, most of us lean one direction or another. I tend to be curious and I have to work a little harder to be candid. But that's why in the passage, and I didn't read this, Paul says, speak the truth in love. We need to continue to be connected, to be curious, and be candid. And as we begin to do those things, I believe that we will maintain a sense of connection. And God will use that to help bring peace and goodness to others. Now, as we wrap up this time, I want to give us a couple of glimpses of what this can look like over the long haul. And my, my first example involves my wife. Um, we grew behind, beyond all the butter incident. And uh, this, uh, this, this actually grew out of uh, uh, experience that we had in 2003 when we adopted our youngest son from Murmansk, Russia. Um, we traveled over there, and as we were leaving the orphanage after a whole process there, um, we looked out the car window, and we got a glimpse of this picture of these kids that were still there, that were a part of it. And that picture really sunk into our hearts, particularly in Susie's heart. And she thought, you know, we've got four kids, and we think our family's complete, but that, that image haunted her. And what she could have done was go out and said, I'm going to be superwoman and I'm going to try to fix this problem. I'm going to try to bring hope to these children by myself. But what she began to do is pray about and find, she found a connection with people who are passionate about the issue of adoption. And so she did that and she began to get connected with other people. And I can tell you stories. There have been challenges along the way as they've learned to partner with other organizations or partner with other people. She's had to both be curious and be candid and she does a great job of modeling both. But the impact is now 20 years later after that first experience that we had, there's a ministry that started within the walls of the church, but now connects with over 150 churches across the state of Indiana to help them make a difference in caring for vulnerable children. And I don't share that story because we're all going to go out and launch a ministry. I wanted to give us a picture of what begins to happen over the long haul. But I want to share a, a, a little story that actually is maybe a, a little easier for most of us to connect with. 
Um, we've got a young man named Connor here at Grace Fishers who's part of Merge, which is our high school ministry. And this is a picture of Connor serving, and actually he's serving back there. He's part of our production team even this morning. And as I thought about Connor, Connor a couple of years ago was curious about production. Uh, and he, so he took a step to, to join our production team. And as I talk to him, he says he's curious uh, about uh, learning things and he likes to be around people that are older than him. Uh, But he said sometimes it's a little bit challenging to be around people who uh, know a lot more than you do and have a lot of skill, uh, more skills than you. But Connor has learned to be around them. He's learned to be curious and ask a lot of questions about why do we do this and why do we do this. And then Connor was, I would say, a pretty quiet young man when I first got to know him, but I've seen him more and more begin to assert himself and begin to to be honest about who he is and ask questions like, he'll say things like, well, what if we did it this way? He begins to express uh, his thoughts and his ideas. And you see, Connor has benefited from serving as a part of the church But we've also benefited in ways probably that we don't always understand. And I am confident that there are a number of Connors in this congregation. And if Connor, as a 16-year-old young man, could take a step and be courageous and to be connected into this church, I bet there's other people that need to take and follow a step just like Connor Because friends, I just want to remind you that there's something that God has blessed you with that not just this church needs, but the church needs. And I want to transition us. uh, We're going to continue in worship in just a moment. But I just want to transition us into a time of prayer. And a prayer not just for Grace Fishers, but to pray for our church, for the nation, and the nation, our church around the world. And actually what I'm going to do is adapt some words from Ephesians 4. So I want you to close your eyes, um, get comfortable, and listen to these words as I pray them. Now these are the gifts that Christ gave to his church. And their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity on our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be like immature children. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts to grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. And Father, in many ways those words are a prayer that I think Paul was praying as he wrote them for his church. And I pray that you would help us to live into our calling as peacekeepers. I pray that we would be willing to be connected to one another I pray that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit curiosity and that you would help us to have the courage to be candid when we need it. And we pray all these things in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. Like Kevin said, we're going to enter just a space where we can respond and we can worship, and that's going to look very different from person to person, yet united in the spirit of Christ. So we're going to sing a song that reminds us, as Kevin said, we're horizontally connected to one another, to the body of Christ, but also vertically connected uh, to our Father. Jesus used an illustration of vine and branches, and how we are the branches, and we remain connected to the vine because we depend on one who is greater, who is stronger uh, than we are. So I'll give a few more instructions in a moment, but let's just enter this space, uh, give this time to God, allow his spirit to speak over the next uh, 10, 12 minutes together.
daily bread. I depend on you. I depend on you for the sun to rise, for my sleep at night. Oh, I depend on you. Yes, I depend on you. just to reflect upon, maybe even wrestle with uh, during this time. The music's going to continue playing. And as I said earlier, this is a space of freedom. 
you're welcome to interact how you feel led. That might look like standing, sitting, reflecting, praying. We also have members of our prayer team who would be so ecstatic if they could pray for you in this moment. And they're going to be throughout the room. Just want to encourage you, if you feel led, maybe you don't have the words to lift up the prayer that needs to be lifted up today. I guarantee we have some amazing people. They would consider that their privilege this morning. So let's just spend a few moments, reflect, pray, continue listening for God's spirit to lead. Give us those words in this moment.
Lord, there's someone who needs to know these words this morning, Lord. Our dependence is upon you. Our weakness and brokenness is perfected in your strength and in your power. Lord, we don't have to do it alone. We are not alone. We have each other. We are rooted and grounded in you. Yes, I depend on you. Sing 